Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Empty Frame Studios, powered by Pulse Cellular. Lance, how are you? Doing very well. It's good to be here in the uh, Pulse Cellular Empty Frame Studios in Wormtown, nestled in our little black box. We sure are nestled here, Lance, and it's a good thing because it's a scary world out there. And if you've listened to Billy Jensen's book, Chase Darkness with me, or his new podcast, The Murder Squad, with Jensen and Holes, you understand that it's a dangerous world. And that's why we're here with Billy Jensen to lighten the mood a little bit and make all this murder talk a little more digestible. And it also should put you at ease to know that there are people like him out there who are working with law enforcement and trying to figure out new ways that can effectively end certain criminals, I guess, reign of terror or or find certain criminals. And if you haven't heard his book, Chase Darkness With Me yet, that is a must listen to or must read. Check it out from Audible. It's called Chase Darkness With Me from Billy Jensen, and it is excellent. If you liked I'll Be Gone in the Dark, you will love Chase Darkness With Me. And if you want a hardcover, it is available on Amazon.com. So that is the place to go to get Billy Jensen's new work, in addition to your podcast feed, where you can subscribe to The Murder Squad, which is an excellent new podcast. And before we get to our general announcements, just wanted to let our international listeners know that Finding Maura Murray, the docu-series from Crawl Space Media and us over at Missing Maura Murray, is now available worldwide on Vimeo. So check it out. There are links in the show notes, or you can go to Vimeo.com and search for Finding Maura Murray. That's Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O. And we have a live show coming up on May 22nd, Lance, in Nashua, New Hampshire. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Wednesday, May 22nd at the Riverwalk Cafe. That's 35 Railroad Square in Nashua, New Hampshire. That's where we did the Science Cafe's forensic science panel we were introduced to the venue and introduced to the owners and the managers and it it was a really cool venue and we thought it would be a cool space to do uh, an intimate engagement for a live show there's a full bar full menu and that's at 6 p.m on may 22nd and we are featuring bruce maitland brianna maitland's father greg overacker And Lou Barry. And between Greg and Lou, they've both looked into and worked on Brianna's disappearance for better than a a decade. 13 years combined, they looked into this. We'll also have Chloe Cantor there from True Crime Twins. And we'll go over Brianna's disappearance. And we'll also talk about Bruce's nonprofit organization, Private Investigations for the Missing. And it'll be a great conversation that will wrap up with some Q&A at the end. It'll be great. So come on out to the Riverwalk Cafe in Nashua, New Hampshire on May 22nd. And there's a link for tickets in the show notes. Or you go to our website, crawlspace-media.com. Right there on the front page, you'll see the uh, little flyer there. Click on it and it'll take you to brown paper tickets where you can purchase your tickets. Speaking of our website, crawlspace-media.com, Lance, we have added a paypal button where you can donate if you would so choose to donate to us and as a companion to that we're also on patreon and the reason why we added that paypal button is because some people just uh they don't want to be on patreon so if you want to donate to us but you don't want to deal with patreon that option is now there and lance for patreon for our patrons our lovely lovely patrons what are we offering them well we have different tiers different levels that you can sign up for And that varies from outtakes of our sponsor reads, because if you listen to the shows, you know that we get a little bit ridiculous during the release of the sponsor reads, but the the behind-the-scenes versions go on for a little bit longer, and they're they're much more ridiculous than what you actually hear when you're listening to the uh, podcast on your listening uh, device. Plus, we do a live vault, which is sort of a true crime roundup each week. So we do a, a weekly episode that we deliver, so four a month, video shows. Me and Lance, sometimes our wonderful intern slash assistant Brian is here. Sometimes we have guests like Maggie Freeling or Chloe Cantor or other people. And so that has been a lot of fun to do and is really picking up some steam. And speaking of the live show that's coming up on May 22nd, if you are at a certain tier on our Patreon page, you will be able to get together with us for a sort of meet and greet, question and answer answer more personalized uh, VIP experience. So if you sign up for that particular tier, that's the addition that you'll get as a benefit. And just want to 
give a shout out to our three latest patrons, Tanya G, Kimberly J, and Michelle W. Thank you very much for being one of our patrons. And thank you if you are considering clicking that donate button on the website. It really does go a long way to help support the shows that we produce and give you as much of the quality as possible. And a couple other trips we got coming up this summer, Lance. CrimeCon in June. Check out CrimeCon.com and use code CRAWLSPACE19 when you register to come to CrimeCon in New Orleans June 7th, 8th, and 9th, 2019. You don't want to miss it. It's in New Orleans, which is a great place to be at the beginning of June. And that promo code is for you if you're on the fence and you're not sure if you can go, if you want to go. First of all, if you're even considering it, you should go because you're listening to this show. It's a true crime show. Everybody who is anybody in the true crime genre is there. And then they have Podcast Row. So you can visit Tim and I and you can visit all of the other podcasters that you listen to and you love in the true crime genre. And that code will give you 10% off your standard package ticket. And that should be enough to put you over the edge if you're on the fence. And the True Crime Podcast Festival in Chicago in July. We're going there and we're doing a panel with Otavia Zapala, Sarah Turney, whose sister is Alyssa Turney of the Missing Alyssa podcast. And it's being moderated by Patrick of True Crime Obsessed, who we're a big fans of. So check out tcpf2019.com if you're interested in coming to the True Crime Podcast Festival in Chicago in July. That's July 13th, and it's on the Magnificent Mile, the Marriott in downtown Chicago. Also, this podcast's full catalog is available on Stitcher Premium, so check it out at stitcherpremium.com and use code MMM. You might be wondering if we're ever going to get to the show. (laughs) And here it is. So follow us on social media, and thank you very much for listening. Buy Billy Jensen's book, and don't just use an audible credit on it. Buy it. And thank you very much for listening. Welcome to Crawl Space, Billy Jensen. Billy, how's it going today? How you doing, fellas? It's going real good. Good. Good, yes. It seems like it's going really, really good for you and for your uh, partner there, uh, Paul Holes. Um, the last time we all spoke was at CrimeCon, which was wonderful, CrimeCon in Nashville, and a lot has happened since then. So, Fill us in a little bit on uh, on on what the has going... happened since CrimeCon. Yeah, so everything. CrimeCon. I had just I had just sold my audio book, so I was working on that, which uh, comes out uh, by the time we're doing this, it'll be out in uh, on Audible. And um, me and Paul had been kind of throwing around ideas for um, a podcast. I had an idea, sort of as a podcast that was going to be a, an extension of the audio book. Uh, with cases that that um, you know, you, you you write a book about about how to solve murders and unsolved crimes and and how citizens can get into it. But then I was sort of thinking, all right, well, wh- what do I do then? You know, so everybody had always asked me to do a podcast, but this seemed like a perfect opportunity. And uh, we really started working on the podcast in July of last year. Really, and it just took yeah, it just took a while for. Um, the deal to get done and lawyers and all that jazz. So yeah, it just kept on getting pushed back and pushed back. But, um, so that's weird. It wasn't meant to be that the podcast and the book were going to come out right at the same time, but it happened. Well, it seems like perfect timing. Yeah. Though. Yeah. So your book is called chase darkness with me and your podcast is called the murder squad and, uh, with Jensen and holes. Um, very exciting stuff. Excellent podcast at the point where we record this, there's uh, been two episodes out And uh, they're both uh, extremely interesting, easy listens. And um, I really love the angle you guys are taking with trying to get the entire audience to help uh, share this information and to really help move these cases forward. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's just it's we want it to be active. We want people to uh, play a part in it. You know, I really think that true crime fans have been listening to podcasts and watching uh, you know, listen to audiobooks and, and watching documentaries for about five or six years now um, since the whole sort of true crime renaissance. And I think it's time for us to enter true crime 2.0, which is you can take all that knowledge now and as well as whatever social circles that you have in order to help solve some of these crimes. 
Now, was that the intention when you first decided to embark on this podcast journey? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. That was the number one thing. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. And, um, you know, it's worked out so far. And the thing is, you got to get cases that, that are shareable, that have things that, you know, so that's why we went with Bradford first and, and Allenstown, uh, which, you know, the Allenstown 4 case, the Bear Brook case, that's kind of been my white whale for the last four or five years. So, uh, you know, we went with those two because there's things that are in those cases that are shareable that, hey, do you remember this? If you send it out to other people, um, do you recognize them, that kind of thing? And then, you know, some of the cases that we're going to do are going to be not so much visually driven, but more um, you know, kind of factually driven. But um, uh, there's going to be less visual elements to it, which um, might make it a little bit more uh, difficult for people to wrap their heads around. But it's it should work very well for a uh, uh, for a pod. You know, and we put all the photos up on social and then also up, take a look at it and see if anything jogs their memory. Okay, and and what are, what else are those characteristics um, like for a case that you would choose to uh, on for your podcast? Yeah, so the, you know, it was it's really about a case that um, that doesn't necessarily have to be uh, you know cold, but it's something that nobody's really working on. You know, so I guess it would be a cold case, and uh, there might be one detective that's really working on it that would like to be able to amplify it. We've offered uh, to donate money to uh, run familial DNA tests or to extract DNA from certain murder victims that are unidentified. And we have offers out to, you know, and just to, we're in the red tape mode now um, with organizations and, and law enforcement organizations. Can we actually take their money? That kind of thing. We're just like, let's do this and let's do this now. You always want answers. That's one thing. But the other thing is that you, uh, you don't know if this person is out there and potentially could kill again. So if you find a, an unidentified murder victim, you have a, a, a lot less of an opportunity to to find out who killed them um, because you don't know who is in their social circles. You can't talk to people and find out, you know, who are they around. So that's a big part of solving a lot of these crimes. And there's, you know, there's 40 to 60,000 unidentified remains sitting in storage lockers or in pauper's graves right now uh, across the country. Um, they're not all murder victims, but... Um, you know, quite a few of them are. And that's one of the focuses that we have uh, for the podcast. Now, uh, with some true crime podcasters like us, uh, for example, it's not the easiest thing to be able to get in contact with current uh, law enforcement who are investigating these open cases. But mm -hmm. with you and your partner now, Paul Holes, have you found that to be uh, less challenging? Well, you know, um, I've always had a pretty decent rapport uh, being able to reach out just from having done this for 20 years, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, there's certain people that you know are not going to talk to you. Um, there's certain people that you know are going to talk to you but not going to give you anything, you know. Uh, <laughs> there are certain law enforcement people in New Hampshire that you know will actually be fine to talk to you, but they're not necessarily going to give you anything. Yeah. And um, uh, But there's other people um, on those same investigations that want to have a partnership. And you see that with the second episode uh, about Bear Brook, which was, um, uh, you know, you have Pete Headley, who is very much like my partner in this, um, you know, in that case. And we talk all the time. He calls me all the time. He called me yesterday. And, um, you know, we talk about the different things that are, that are going on with the Bear Brook case and what we can do to find out who was and killed in some of these, these cases and how we can potentially pull the DNA from um, some of these unidentified murder victims. So there's a lot to do there. And, um, you know, it just depends. It goes on a case by case basis as far as who wants to uh, cooperate. Now, before we get into the further uh, inner workings of Murder Squad, which I find extraordinarily fascinating, can you just give us a little bit of a background as to how you connected with Paul Holes, what his background is, and why you guys came together and said, this is what we want to do? My friend Michelle was writing a book on the Golden State Killer, and she passed away. And I volunteered to help finish the book um, with her researcher, Paul Haynes. So we got together, uh, we finished the book, and, and obviously Paul was a, Paul Holes was a major part of that investigation. So... I got in touch with Paul Holes, and we just had a really good natural rapport. Um, we met up, uh, you know, I made sure at CrimeCon 
that he got his kind of hero's welcome that he wasn't able to get at that press conference for the Golden State Killer where they didn't even let him talk. Uh, because I knew, I knew, I knew right away as soon as I, um, I found out, I knew he was the one that did it. He was the one that, that, um, that used familial DNA to get it. So, um, so from there, it was a matter of, you know, keeping in contact and talking about things. And he was, you know, navigating the spaces of Hollywood. And I was like trying to help him with that. Cause I certainly know a lot of the sharks that are out there in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, we were on my favorite murder with Georgia and Karen and, uh, had a great time there. And then we, Georgia and Karen had said, you know, if you guys are it, just to me, if you want, if you're going to like start a podcast or something, just ask us first, cause we're starting this new network. And I said, well, actually I've got an, an outline for one and here's what I'd like to do. And I think Paul would probably be a great, um, a great partner in it. So that's how it kind of went from there. And then Paul was game for it because, um, you know, Paul wants to stay within, you know, the investigations community and also talk about crimes other than the Golden State Killer, you know. So um, even though we do have a Golden State Killer um, uh, story coming up, that it's something very, very different from um, from what anything that we've seen before. So That's great. Yeah, very interesting. Is there a particular dynamic that you and Paul have? Are you sort of the the you uh like you said you you helped him navigate his way around hollywood and Mm -hmm. you have the knowledge of the sharks out there and he's got the knowledge of the inner workings of the police department and law enforcement is that sort of the the dynamic you two uh work around with each other you know really what i do and what paul does is you know i'm the storyteller and i've been that that's you know even though i'm an investigator now even though i've helped solve murders and i'm used by police to to, to help use social media to solve these murders. I've been, um, uh, you know, I've been a storyteller my whole life. So, you know, I, I work on the story of it and the, and the outline of it. And then Paul brings in the forensics and we complement each other really, really well. So it's better than having to, I would never want to do it with like another journalist. I mean, if I did it with another journalist, it would just be us drinking the entire time. I think that's pretty much it. So at least now we can, it, it is Paul and me drinking for, but it's, um, <laughs> It, it is a different dynamic there, yeah. How long does it take you to record an episode? To record a single episode is just like two hours, maybe two and a half hours. But, you know, it's all in the, the devil's in the details and the prep work. You yeah. Know, that's, that's where everything is at. So, you know, is um, we're, we're the, the prep work is, uh, you know, the, the major part of it, collecting all the materials and everything. And, you know, some cases, you know, we started with two very, you know, one case, the Bear Brook case, is an incredibly convoluted case once it, once it gets there. And, and uh, Polly, our producer, did an amazing job actually splicing it together because that was like a, a two and a half hour episode um, that was just too, too, it's just too confusing. I have it. I write, I write two um, chapters of it in my book, but the guy had so many different aliases and was, was such an evil guy that, um, I mean, there's a reason why he was under the radar he, and he was able to operate under the radar killing these families for so long. So, um, and then with Bill Bradford, you know, there was just so many images and pictures and everything. So, you know, there'll be certain cases coming up in the future that are a little bit more, quote unquote, simpler, uh, that won't have as many um, details and bells and whistles and that kind of thing. So, but, you know, these two in particular, but they're also ones that I've worked on a lot. So they were, they were easier to do because I had everything at my fingertips. I had, you know, the L.A. Sheriff's Department had given me their entire case file. Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, with all the images and stuff. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. The Terry Rasmussen case there, that is, that does seem to be a complicated story because, uh, because of all of his identities and really it kind of just, uh, it, it jumps around a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's well, kind of, yeah, yeah, it does because it's like, you know, we start telling a story about, yeah, you start with the bodies in the barrels mm-hmm. and then you go to, um, you know, him, abandoning little Lisa in the trailer park, but he's, but he's, he's has a different name. And then you go to them discovering that Lisa has been abused. And then he's winds up with on June and he kills on June June and all that stuff. And it's, it's just, um, and now what we're trying to do is find out exactly, you know, where he, he was and what other crimes he could have committed. And we think that the woman in the refrigerator, uh, definitely there is also something that we didn't get to in the podcast. Uh, episode was that uh, he was seen in Anaheim with a woman and a six month old child. And we still don't know who that woman was. Ugh. And just based on his, 
his history, there's a good good chance that that person could have been uh, murdered as well, as well as the baby. Yeah, that's awful. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, you can make some progress and, and have you been, um, getting a lot of help from the citizen detectives out there? Yeah, we've gotten a lot of stuff and we're putting everything in, uh, you know, Google spreadsheets and, and sharing it with each other. And I've, uh, uh, and then, you know, we're going to parse out the ones, you know, if the police say, yeah, give us everything, we'll, we'll send them to them. But, um, um, for the most part though, we're going to parse it out and say, all right, this, these, these look good. Um, and send it to them so they just don't get bogged down with a bunch of, you know, tips that really won't lead anywhere. I mean, luckily, you know, Paul worked on two cases that were two of the biggest cases for citizen detectives, which were, you know, the Zodiac killer and the Golden State killer. So he knows what it's like to be in a place where you're getting tons of tips from people and citizen detectives and things. So he knows, you know, he's been there and he knows um, what it's like to be on the, on the receiving end of that and how much, uh, it can take up a, an investigator's time. So we're going to be really selective in the things that we do send over to the investigators. But like I said, if they want to see everything, we'll just give them everything. You mentioned Zodiac. Do you have any uh, any update there? It w- what happened uh, a few weeks ago with the DNA rumors? Is is this uh, do, Does Paul Holes know who the, who the Zodiac killer is? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Paul does not know who the Zodiac killer is. Uh. I think those those DNA rumors were, it seems like they were bogus. I think they were just put out there and then pulled it right back down that everybody kind of buzzed about them for a little bit. But, you know, whether they can extract DNA from the envelope uh, is, is, is up in the air right now. I'm not quite sure. Uh, last time we talked, he said it was, you know, there's always a possibility. There's always another uh, uh, technique around the corner that could be able to. To, to pull that DNA, but you know, it's one thing to pull the DNA and that's another thing to pull a, a, a whole autosomal DNA. Like, so you can do a familial DNA search for it, you know? So, uh, Golden State Killer, we had rape kits and, and things. And with, um, you know, if we're talking about the only thing that we really have from Zodiac is a, you know, potentially saliva on an envelope that he may or may not have sent. Uh, there's a, there's a big, a big difference between, what we had with GSK and what we have with Zodiac. Billy, spill the beans. We know that you know who Zodiac is. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way no, you don't. <laughs> and it was not it was not Jim Morrison either, as much as Disgraceland tried to fool everybody with their April Fool's um, episode. I don't know if you heard that or not. But, Spoiler. Uh, yeah, yeah. It um no, I do not know. I would tell you guys first if because uh, you guys are OGs. So I would tell you guys first if I if I found out. But <laughs> no, I do not know. <laughs> All right. Do you ever find that it's pretty daunting when you have all you said something um, a a few minutes ago about how the uh, police officers will get sort of bogged down with the details that come in from people who are out there citizen detecting? Do you yourself find it pretty daunting when you're getting all of that information as well? And and did you ever think, like, I don't know if we can handle this? Uh, Not really that we can handle it. Uh, You know, you know from having done this for so long and then also having worked on crime watch daily and, and you know that like somebody's telling you stuff and then you realize, Oh shit, this is a psychic, <laughs> you know, um, you know what well, I mean? What's wrong with psychics? Um, what are you talking about? That's yeah, not real information. Yeah, exa- yeah exactly. So, uh, there's that, there's, you know, you just, you, you can tell when people have good information and when they don't. And then for my own investigations that I talk about and chase darkness with me, they're, you know, you get a lot of bullshit and a lot of people that are either clowning around saying, I know who that is or whatever. And then you, you actually reach out to them and then it's like, now I'm just kidding around. But some of them, you got to follow up on every one of them though, because uh, I had one guy that was kind of being kind of passive aggressive about something. And it turns out he was able to lead me right to this killer on this one case that I did. So it is, um, you know, particularly when you're dealing with social media on specific cases, uh, you gotta you gotta follow up on most everything, but you can tell when somebody's a psychic <laughs> or or feels they have psychic visions or or anything like that. And um, you know, I did in the beginning. I remember getting a tip, and you know, probably ten years ago, and somebody had a tip, and it sounded really good. And then I was like, 
I learned like after three or four different emails, like, oh shit, this person's a psychic. <laughs> so your book, uh, Chase Darkness with Me, are you sort of uh, inviting citizen sleuths to um, to follow the template that you've begun with uh, with this kind of work? You know, inviting, I think, is, a, is kind of a strong word. The... You know, the title was based on some, you know, it's like sometimes I'm chasing shadows, sometimes I'm just chasing darkness is a line in the book. And because um, a lot of times that seems like what what I'm after, uh, you know, I'm giving I knew when people were going to read this book or listen to this book that they were going to some of them were going to want to do it. Uh, so there's a whole part at the end of the book, a whole addendum where it's like, all right, if you want to do this, here's the rules you need to follow. And here's the steps that you can take by doing by doing this, and you can you potentially could help solve some murders. So, um, I mean, it's not a, and I I'm very clear up front. It's not anything for the faint of heart. It's not anything for somebody that wants instant gratification because it's really slow and really heartbreaking. And uh, but you know, when you do get one, and when you do get a resolve, it you know you get a moment of euphoria. But it, honestly, it lasts like I'm. 30 seconds and that's it but you know you just keep going just because there's so many unsolved murders that are out there now what are the rules yeah um, because, i was just gonna say do you have a checklist yeah do you oh yeah i think oh, yeah. lance breaks them all the time but i'm i'm curious to hear what uh what the rules are hey i bend rule don't number break one all right here's rule number one lance <laughs> 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 rule number one is you never name names in public you don't, uh, if you get a tip or something like that, you don't put it out there. Uh, you know, you take that tip, you give it to law enforcement, but you don't put it out on a Facebook page. You don't wonder if, oh, what about this guy? And then put a link to their Facebook page or something. That's the number one rule. That's where you get in trouble. That's where the Boston Marathon investigation on Reddit got in trouble. Um, you just don't do that. Number two is you don't read, when you get tips or, or information, you don't reach out to the family you send them to the investigators and um, uh, you just can't, you, you can't, you, you know, you could be in a vigilante situation. You could, you, you could screw up a lot of people's lives by doing that because those are the people that have the most vested interest in it. You have to take that stuff to the law enforcement agency. Then, you know what? I mean, then it's a matter of, you know, for me, I will always reach out to a law enforcement agency before I start a, an investigation. If they say, hold off, we're close on somebody, I hold off. If they don't answer me, you know, which has happened a couple times, um, after two weeks, I'll just do it. But I'll always give them the opportunity because I don't want to get, I don't want to get in the way of the investigation. Um, but most of the time they say, yeah, we, we're, we have no idea who this is. Can you, yeah, you know, help us out with this, fine. You know, you got to remember that the, um, another rule is you got to remember that you're not always going to get credit. You can't accept credit if you do help with something. Uh, you're not always going, you're not going to get information from the police. It's going to be a one way street. You give them everything. They give you nothing. I've been able to have more partnership relationships with some uh, detectives. And if you're able to, to uh, cultivate that, those kind of relationships, then that's great, but it's not the norm. And you stay safe. You know, you can't go, don't go undercover. Don't pretend you're somebody that you're not. Uh, there's, these are real life and real dangerous people and you have to stay safe. And that's and then also don't dox each other. Don't be a dick to each other online. That's that's the sort of added added rule that uh, we all are after the same thing. We're all after justice. So don't become so possessive and territorial about this clue that you're following or this theory that you have. Yeah, I have broken every single one of those rules. <laughs> dox is Lance's favorite word. It's my middle name now. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about your Facebook page called Inkster Shooter at Fast Frank's Party Shop? Yes. So Inkster Shooter is one of, you know, 60 or 70 um, investigations that I've done trying to use social media in order to solve investigations, solve some crimes. With that one, I actually, um, it turned the heat on, but it didn't lead to the, the arrest. Um, he was, he had shot a man in the face in, um, in a party store, party shop, which I guess in Michigan is what they call liquor stores. And oh, I, I pictured like an eye party. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I thought it was going to be like that too. Like it was going to be someplace where you can get costumes and things, but no, this was an actual liquor store and he went on the run. We didn't know his name first. 
So we just had images of him and then we got his name and then we were searching for him. Uh, he was able to finally uh, get captured. I worked very closely with the marshals on that case. That was very much of a partnership type of case. But he actually went to um, he went to trial and he was found not guilty by reason of self-defense. So that is one one where, um, you know, of the 10 that I've helped uh, solved or helped solve, I don't even really usually count that one, A, because my my work didn't necessarily lead directly to the arrest. It might have led to, like, him moving around a little bit and, and because it, the, the ad was shared so many times and blanketed everywhere in that area. But also the fact that, um, you know, a jury of his peers said that, no, this wasn't a murder. This was, this was self-defense. I don't necessarily know the details of, of how it was self-defense, but, um, you know, that's what happened. And I guess justice was served. Did you still get the key to the city for that one? I did not get the key to the city to uh. Inkster. No, I've yet to be, I've yet to, uh, to visit Inkster. Um, but I was dealing with the actual marshals up there and, um, in, in Michigan, as opposed to like the local cops. But this was, and correct me if I'm wrong, was this the first time that you used this technique to put the... Oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. So... No, no, no. That was The first time was a case in Chicago uh, where I did solve it. And that was the Marcus Gaines case. A guy had been attacked on video in a, on a street corner, and he was attacked by a guy. The guy left him. The guy knocked him out. And then when everybody surrounded the guy, uh, the victim on the street... Uh, he he yelled at them all, and they all went away. And then a cab drove over his chest and killed him. Oh God! So I um, I was watching this video, saying, "How do they not know? You know, they did press conferences, did this and that." They said, "How do they not know who this guy is?" I contacted the family. The family said, "You know, the police aren't really talking to us anymore. We've, it's been four months." And I said, "You know, something clicked in my brain." I said, "I, I think I can help with this." And I got an idea and I started, I set up a Facebook page and I set up Twitter and, you know, I go through all of this in the audio book where this like crazy series of events happens where I was able to identify uh, this guy from a Snapchat video that somebody had taken on the scene and, and, and tweeted to me and then, um, well, tweeted me a still image of it, but then, then tweeted the whole um, uh, direct message to me, the, ent- the entire video. And then I was able to match that up with the mugshots that Cook County actually publishes online for every arrest and was able to find who the guy was. And then, then it was, then it became a manhunt and me get trying to get the Chicago police department to listen to me, which was no easy task. And it took five months for me to tell them that yeah, he's not in Chicago. He's in Minnesota. This is where he is. Go get him. And they finally, uh, the marshals actually uh, picked him up in uh, January. I, I ID'd him in August. Wow. Uh, you know, stuff That's is amazing. Slow. And, and he was, you know, I was monitoring his Facebook page and he was getting into relationships and, you know, posting fit- pictures and having a grand old time. Wow. So, so Chicago gave you the key to the city. No, Chicago didn't give me the key to the city. But you, you said you're supposed to get credit on all these. <laughs> right. Isn't that what the, the <laughs> main that's goal? That's rule number one, right? Get credit? Yes. You don't, you're not supposed to accept credit. Oh, or, or, you're you not? Accept credit, oh, you don't accept credit. No, no, no. You, know, you, don't, you don't expect credit. That's oh, the thing. Oh, you know, you're not okay. always going to. That's, that's a big rule is that you don't expect it. You're not going to get it. You know, um, um, it's going to be very hard for a police officer to, to tell you that. I mean, they did in one case where they actually thanked me from the podium and said that my my page led to the tip, which was great. But then they actually backtracked on that like a year later. It was very strange, you know? So I think a lot of places don't necessarily want to say that a civilian is helping them or, or uh, you know, did, it, did anything for them right. uh, to, to, to solve a case, which is fine. You know, I get, I get hugs from the, the family, and that's all I care about. Right, right. And, uh, and with the Maura Murray case, um, last week there was a press conference up in New Hampshire where uh, Jeffrey Strelzin, the assistant, uh, senior assistant attorney general up there, um, said that they did not find anything on, uh, in the location that was a family-led search. Um, and then the video cut out, but at that point we can only assume Strelzin said thank you to Tim and Lance. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what happened. Yeah, um, uh, Jeff did say that. But no, <laughs> I don't. Um, yeah, it was the sort of 
you know, they were they were trying to say that, you know, the dogs and I, I've talked to many search people who hate those dogs. Uh, they don't like it's almost like the dogs are 50 yeah. 50. You can, you can flip a coin and say, you know, there was something there. There's something isn't there. Um, this is just this is coming from search professionals. And uh, but, you know, the dogs hit on something and they dug it up and I guess they didn't find anything. So uh, and then they had to go and tell tell people about it. It, it, it is another thing for the case that is, you know, in a, at the same time with that happened then. I don't know whether they were waiting on that or whatever, but I think it was like just a couple hours later, the news about Bill Roush came out. So mm-hmm. it uh, it was a, you know, that Moore Murray case is con- going to continue to pop up in the media because of guys like you and guys like Renner and and it's going to continue to thrive until you know we get a definitive answer which i don't know will ever come you said right before this that you uh you don't do it for the obviously you don't do it for the um recognition from the police or or law enforcement but you you said you get the hugs from the family uh, and that's worth it for you that's pretty cool Uh, who are you close with um that you can tell us who's reached out and said hey i appreciate what you've done and do you maintain these relationships with the with the families of victims I do, yeah. Um, Drexina, who is Marcus Gaines' cousin, but really like his sister because they lived together um, you know, since they were little kids. Uh, I maintain contacts with her. But, you know, really, it's more, the, you know, the, the best friend of one of those guys in El Monte. Um, I still, you know, we're Facebook friends now. There's a lot of people that I, um, that, of active cases that I still check in with. And quite frankly, I, I check in more with the active cases ones, you know, to see what's going on and see if there's anything I could do to help. And, um, you know, because it's, it's constantly, you know, trying to solve that next one. And, you know, a lot of times they'll, you know, I'll have conversations with them over Facebook at two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you know, you become less an investigator and more of a, uh, just not necessarily a shoulder to cry on. I don't want to put that much that be hyperbolic, but, you know, they're just looking for somebody to talk to and somebody that understands the case and knows it and knows, you know, potentially what they're going through. I find myself doing that, which is actually kind of nice because so much of the job or the hobby or whatever you want to call what I do, uh, is, is alone. It's a, it's a lonely thing. You know, you're doing it by yourself and, uh, it's good to be able to talk to people. So what role does Facebook play in what you do as opposed to other social media channels? Facebook is big just because it's got the tools to buy ads and buy geo-targeted ads are really good. And also you can narrow it down and and more people have still more people use Facebook than anything else. Uh, I wish I would have came up with the idea 10 years ago and Facebook is really humming, but it is what it is. So Facebook, I would say, is number one. Uh, uh, Instagram, number two. But the problem with Instagram is you can't share. And then Twitter would be three. And I've dabbled with Snapchat a little bit, but I think those are really the big ones when it comes to social media. Great. Um, what about Reddit? Is that something you use much? Oh, yeah. No, Reddit I use for information about specific clues. Like if I have a picture of a car, and I don't know what kind of car it is, I'll go on the, 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 uh, the Reddit car boards, and then I'll get an answer within five minutes, you know, or, or a hat, or uh, go on the sneakerheads uh, one if I have a picture of some sneakers and trying to figure out what they are, or maybe a t-shirt logo, that sort of stuff that, that Reddit, I think that's the, one of the best things about Reddit. It's not somebody like kind of taking a case and, and running with it. Usually if you take a case and you run with it, like, like Rhonda Randall did with um, the Elmstown four, or like you guys did, you kind of like, you go off of Reddit and you kind of start your own thing. Um, but, you know, and you can find certain things about it, but it really is. It's the people that are, not even, you know, they're, they just have all this really good information about stuff that has nothing to do with crime. But if you have a clue that you need to identify, you go into that place in the same way that if I had a picture of a car and I would go around to before the Internet, I would have to go to every car dealership and say, do you guys, you guys are car guys or, or mechanics and say, do you guys know what this what this car is? I'm able to do that and get an answer within five minutes because people will look at it and say, yeah, I can tell by the angle of that taillight that it is a 1993 you know, Toyota Camry and it looks like it has this package or whatever because of this thing on it, or it's got these runners here and it's pretty remarkable. That's mainly what I use Reddit for. 
that's interesting. You're using all of this technology and social media in what you just described as your hobby, which is hilarious because I don't know, <laughs> I don't know anyone who's got a hobby that takes up um, so much time that you're you're up at two in the morning commiserating <laughs> with <laughs> victims' families, which is very commendable. But that's not how it all started for you, right? You got started on this because you were fascinated with the JFK assassination, and that was back. Obviously, he was assassinated back before <laughs> any of this. Yeah, was I'm not even... that old. Okay? Right, right. No, no. <laughs> I was ten years old at sixty-three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, but, no, I would watch I watched a movie about um, Nostradamus uh, and I go over this in the book and um, it was about all these predictions that Nostradamus made, which oh, was yeah. all bullshit. The Man yeah. Who yeah. Saw but, Tomorrow, but, uh, right? The Man Who yeah. Saw Tomorrow. I love yeah. that movie. And uh, but there was this one part about the JFK assassination and they showed the grassy knoll and they showed the outline of the of the shooter behind the grassy knoll. And I freaked out and I started. I went the next day, actually, that was probably a Saturday night. So on the next Monday, um, I went to my, my, uh, junior high library and I took, and I have all the Kennedy books, you know, and, uh, the assassination books, like the Mark Lane books and, and even Gerald Posner books. And so I went from there and I, then I started learning about forensics and blood spatter and, and magic bullets and everything. And, you know, that you literally were chasing shadows there because those were shadows. I mean, there was, I believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone after everything, after all of that research that I did as a little kid. Um, you know, I, what I explain to people is that every schmuck has his day and, and he had his day on November 22nd. Now, you're you're a little kid and you're looking into this and you're freaked out by this concept of a man on the grassy knoll. How did did you know at that moment when you were looking at, into the JFK assassination that you would then embark on this as a career that this would be your life path? No. I uh you know, it's always something that I kind of wanted to do. Um, writing journalism in particular was something that I was so, I was good at, but I never wanted to do it. And I would like write for, I would write papers. I would be really good in English, but it was always something that I never wanted to do. And I, I consistently shied away from it, even though teachers would say, this is what I should do. And, um, so there was that, there was also this kind of investigative, uh, angle to it. And I went to school for, I studied religious studies. I got my master's degree in religious studies, studying cults, but I, I was studying Christian apocalyptic cults um, with a with a sort of a you know I was I was leaning towards the ones that were doing crimes. So even though I was I went into a major that was so different from you know crime or journalism, it you know it pulled me back into it. And uh, once I got to a place where you know, I started writing about the other thing that was big in my life was sports. I was a big sports kid. And when I started writing about, you know, starting a zine about hockey fights and then the Village Voice saw it and said, do you want to write something? And then I just took off from there and I would pitch crime stories for two years and they would always say no. And then finally I started doing them. You're like the, the Michael Corleone of crime stories. <laughs> So they but, pulled me back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you also work for the Boston Phoenix, which was a once very cool independent newspaper, right? You were the editor in chief. Is that true? I was. Yeah, I was the editor. I think it was just called editor. I think they had an executive editor and they had an editor. That was the. Yeah. But um, yes, I was there for a year and a half or something. And I saw the writing on the wall and I actually got offered another job, um, you know, and, you know, when you think at the Village Voice and then. Both of those papers are non-existent. Uh, um, my my resume is filled with dead papers and dead magazines. Well, <laughs> There's I, just a lot of deadness going on in, when you look at my resume. I think I'm trying to very subtly paint a superhero picture of you, that you're by day this oh, editor okay. of the yes. you know renegade independent newspaper, and, and by night you're... You're the superhero that is uh, geo-targeting uh -huh. criminals, and but the problem is that you know what the the when you're editor of a of a newspaper like the Boston Phoenix or the Village Voice or or you know as managing editor of the Long Island Press, you're supposed to be out at night going to shows and you know having your finger on the pulse of the nightlife of the city. So I don't know when I would, I guess I would do it after the bars close at two. And then two to two to six is when I would be fighting crime uh, if I was doing that at that time. But yeah, um, you know, I do. I, I miss that type of journalism. I miss the camaraderie of the of the newsroom. Uh, but I was always more, you know, there was always a lot of political uh, stories that they wanted to cover. And I was never a political guy. I just think it's 
it's uh, it's just a dog and pony show, and I was never that into it. Except with your JFK assassination love. Except with the JFK assassination, which really had nothing to do with. I mean, it had it was less politics and more, right. you know, an unhinged, unhinged kid. Right, an unhinged kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you currently uh, chasing down criminals right now? Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got a couple of uh, ads that I've rerun. I've got a, a new one that I'm just uh, starting on right now. And, you know, with the, the book tour, I'm not able to. And then I've got the ones that we did on the podcast as well. So, But there's there's other ones that they've asked me, you know, certain agencies have asked me, hey, can you, can you do this one that I've helped with? And a lot of them, you know, it's weird, too, because, you know, you find ones that are good, that, that you good meaning like it's got a good piece of video. They haven't been able to find a guy in six months. I think I can help when you do when you help them and you're able to get them in a, an arrest. Then they're like they tell everybody, hey, there's this guy that does this thing. And then they send you other cases and the cases often don't have a piece of video. or They uh, they just have a sketch in there from 10 years ago. And do you think you could help? And you never want to say no, but it is. So I do them. But, you know, I know that they're they're. There's, there's a good chance that we're not going to get anything from it. So, but, um, you know, I still do them anyway. So I got a few of those out there as well. Now, uh, we saw that you were uh, in New York recently at the Death Becomes Us uh, festival. And uh, we posted a picture that was taken at, the, at a dinner that you attended. And yeah. uh, this was quite a star studded dinner. Uh, you, uh, that was, that yeah. was, that was, you know, when they say never meet your heroes, you yeah. know, but I met John Douglas and I hung out with him and I sat next to him at dinner and he's the coolest guy. He's exactly the way you'd want him to be. Uh, he, he wrote a blurb for my book too. Um, and he, um, he was just super cool. So yeah, no, there was, uh, the guy that plays his partner, Holt, Holt the actor yeah. yeah, who Holt, Holt, sorry who plays his partner, uh, Robert Ressler, who has since passed away on the show. He, he was, he actually took us all out. Um, I think the gentleman to John's right is a new guy that's on the show, a new yeah. actor. Um, Emily from mile marker, uh, uh, 81 or 181. She was there. Paul was there. And then I'm talking to this woman across from me and john's kids were there too and i'm but i'm talking to this woman across from me she's telling me about her son's case and i was like wait a minute you're john juca's mom and that was john juca's mom so you know the grid kid case the grid kid killer, oh, yeah. uh, case so yeah his, um, her son has been and what she did was she had a story written about her in vanity fair where she actually went undercover and started and befriended a juror from her son's case who who she thought had um didn't even really pay attention to the case and just knew the guy was guilty, for, knew her son was guilty from the beginning, he said, and got him to say that on tape. Right. Um, like, really fascinating stuff. Like, like, once he gets out, there'll be a movie made about it. And, uh, and she was there, too. And I was like, yeah, I worked at Crime Watch Daily. We did that story. And, I'm, you know, so that was really, it was really great to have everybody there. And it was a great, great night. And that was right after we saw... Um, who was it? it was, oh, it was Damien Eccles and Amanda Knox put on a, a um, you know, sort of a, a, a talk about the wrongfully accused with John. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We're very familiar with um, with John Juca's case. Yeah. We've we've spoken to Doreen several times and uh, interviewed her um, a few times for uh, for Crawl Space. It is a, uh, a fascinating case. And uh, it was really like worlds colliding seeing that picture um, mm -hmm. posted, I think, on like a Saturday or Sunday morning. It was like, oh, wow. Look, these are so many people that we kind of I mean, we know we know you. We've met you a few times. But, uh, you know, we know Doreen, but we know we kind of we know of Paul and uh, Holt is kind of he follows us and all that. But and obviously John Douglas um, and we're huge fans of Mindhunter. So uh, yeah. so that was a pretty cool um pretty and cool then, picture. Did you see who who's in the corner? Yeah, <laughs> like randomly uh Stephen Colbert's in the corner. <laughs> Stephen Colbert's in the corner and the great thing is he's looking at us. Yeah. While they, <laughs> like he was trying to have a nice date out probably with his wife or something and we we're just talking murder <laughs> and cases and everything and we were pretty loud so um Good. But, yeah, no, that was pretty fun. You should have just turned around and been like, relax. <laughs> relax. It's okay. We're yeah. professionals. That's the guy from Mindhunter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, that was cool. And uh, no, it, was, it was a great um, a great weekend all around. Just met some really great people. Man and Knox is, is amazing. And Damien was really super cool. And, uh, you know, just people within that crime community when 
you know, you go to do your event and then you can go out for drinks afterwards. And that's where the, you know, the fun stuff happens and you can laugh about things. And, um, it was, it was a really cool event. I think they're going to do another one in DC in November. And they're talking about the people that they're talking about getting for that one sound really cool as well. So I kind of described it as like, that's kind of like the New Yorker festival for crime. Whereas crime con is like the, the comic con for crime. Uh, you know, this one's a little bit more like, you know, it's not like a buy one, buy, buy one ticket, go everywhere. It's kind of like smaller events and putting, matching people together that wouldn't normally be together and that kind of thing. So I think it was, um, that's how I was describing the two festivals. That's a, that's a really great comparison. So what else is coming up on, uh, the murder squad? Yeah, we, you know, we banked about nine episodes. So we're going to, you know, because we, we were, every time we were going to be in the same place, we, we, we knocked out an episode. So, um, We've got, uh, let's see, what case is coming up? We've got a case, I won't tell you what it is, but it's a case out of Michigan. So that's the next one. It's not the Oakland child killer. So Should we just um, guess? <laughs> we can take like another <laughs> couple hours here and we can just guess. <laughs> I just and, don't. Um, after that, um, you know, we're going to be uh, right up against the first anniversary of GSK's uh, arrest. So. We've got something planned for that as well. So that, that's going to be in the fourth episode. So we've got that going on. We've got the HBO documentary on I'll Be Gone in the Dark, the docuseries that right. we're both a part of. And that will be uh, airing probably in 2020. Oh, excellent. And yeah. And then myself and Paul are in a sh- I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that yet, but myself and Paul are on a um, are on a special on Oxygen in the beginning of June. Cool. So it'll be a week a week before the the um, a week before Crime Con in New Orleans, which is going to be Crime Con in New Orleans is going to be interesting. And I and I I do kind of is it? Do you guys know if it's in a centralized location or is it just going to be everywhere? Because New Orleans is not a good place to walk around at night um, when you're drinking because people get rolled all the time over there. So. I'm wondering what the what the security precautions are going to be like for all these people that are going to be down there. I don't Good know. Question. Yeah, we know sure. uh, we know Art Roderick's going to be there, so I guess we're all safe. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So um, no, I think it's going to you know, and again, CrimeCon is one of those fun places where you get to you get to meet everybody and, and meet these people that are really into it. But and you could also you also meet the, the the podcasters that you know and you listen to, which is always a fun thing to do. Very fun. And uh, I'm curious, are uh, the My Favorite Murder Women, Karen and Georgia, are you going to have one on every episode? No. Okay. No, those are just the first two. Those are the first two episodes. And then we have, we have guests every now and again and kind of uh, just to have – a lot of times we were noticing as we were talking that we, you know, we need to explain things because it's so – you know, we're in our heads a lot and we, we don't know if anybody knows what exactly CODIS is or what, you know what I mean? So sure. for, for the average listener. So it's good to have some, a guest on there to be like, well, what are you talking about? That kind of thing. So we can step back and say, all right, well, this is, this is because of this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. A lot of times, yeah. like, you know, there's so many different sayings and, and things that when me and Paul get going that an average listening I mean, the core listeners are going to know, but like sort of like the average listener, well, you know, once you get past a certain amount, the listener is going to be like, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And you need that, uh, that every man kind of voice who, uh, mm-hmm. will, will ask those type of questions. Exactly. So, yeah. so yeah, we'll exactly. gladly fill in anytime you need us. I mean, to. If this okay. is an invitation that you just well, have we to would have to pick one of you guys. Though, so okay. I would let, let you guys fight to the death for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be like, like, uh, in the, like, <laughs> like in the, uh, in the dark night, right. Returns or whatever. When he, uh, just break when, the, when the break Joker the pool says stick we're going to have yeah. uh, auditions or whatever. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Break the stick. Yep. yep. And it'll be that. That's actually every day. <laughs> that's in every here day anywhere. here. Yeah. yeah. And that's over lunch. <laughs> that's just over where we're ordering lunch. <laughs> Well, gets, very cool. It's nasty. Uh, yeah, b- best of luck to you, Bill. And uh, w- with everything you're doing, you're um, an incredibly busy guy and incredibly successful. So uh, we want to ride your coattails as long as we can. R- r- ride them, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, re- it's so funny to hear incredibly successful after trying to trying and failing so often, you know. And um, it, it's just that, you know, it all comes when it rains and pours. And it was a lot of just uh, trying and failing, particularly in Hollywood, trying to make make i talked about this in the book of trying to do 
stories about unsolved murders on TV and having every door slammed in my face or, 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 or making a pilot. To see it all come together is it's, it's a good feeling, but it's not like I'm going to just stop. Well, we're, uh, we're privileged to say that we knew you back then. And it's, it's great to hear from you guys, and I look forward to uh, hanging out with you guys in New Orleans. Thank you.